Hi, I'm Danny Gavigan, member of the resident acting company at Everyman Theater and the creator and host of the podcast you're about to listen to, Everyman Theater's Resident Ghost Company. This podcast was made possible through the generosity of the Galanthus Foundation and listeners like you. Please consider making a donation to support more work like this by texting GHOST, that's G-H-O-S-T, to 44321, or by visiting everymantheater.org. Can you hear me? There we go. How you doing, man? I'm, I'm good. I'm blessed. That's good. It's good to see you. This is Shema Moore, the porter for our theater. Shema has been a member of the Everyman family for about as long as I have. He's the first one in the building and the last to leave. If anyone's seen anything, it would be him. I'm doing this podcast about ghosts, and I know, you know, you stay all hours in the building, and I know you've talked about it before. Can you just tell me um, everything you've experienced? I had a couple of ghost encounters a few times at the job. When I first started working there, this was around five and six in the morning when I got to work. I noticed there wasn't no one in the building, but I heard the piano playing. And I thought it was, you know, my boss in the building or whatever the case may be. And he called me to let me know he wasn't in the building and the piano was playing by itself. Up in the lobby, playing by itself. A couple of weeks later, after the show, I had to clean up the theater. This is just before I knew where the light switch was. It gets pitch black, so... I said, okay, uh... Man, I wish I had some help. I was like, I wish I had some help or whatever. And I felt the spiritual presence touch me. You know, I immediately <laughs> ran to the theater because I was like, oh, snap, I'm not playing around. I went to the bathroom. I buttoned my shirt. I was like, bruh. I know, good and well, this ain't what I think it is. I came home, there was this big old handprint on the left side of my shoulder. What is this on my shoulder? It looked like a red handprint, like, it looked like your hand. It looked like someone just took their hand and like, literally, Bro, there's a ghost in this building. You feel like there's other people there. Poltergeist guy, dance hall girl. There's something kind of creepy upstairs in the rehearsal hall. But the cool thing about our theater is the consistency of stories from new people who have the same experience. This is a podcast about a haunted house and its theater company with as many members as it has ghost stories. I'm Danny Gavigan, and this is Everyman Theater's Resident Ghost Company. The more I talk with my company about ghosts, I'm realizing that experiences like the one Shema had are pretty typical of our theater. And I keep hearing about sightings of a man who cuts a similar figure to the one I saw backstage. Tall, well-dressed, and in a hat. Here's resident acting company member Megan Anderson. If I'm sitting at the bar or I'm in the lobby of the theater, the man who hangs out in the mezzanine, he's wearing a hat and a suit and he strikes me as tall. Do you know who I'm talking about? Have other people spoken about him? This actually happens often. This is Corey Fryer Rich, our Associate Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Corey spends a lot of his day in the box office and lobby area just below our mezzanine. I was in the lobby and I saw a glimpse of someone standing on the mezzanine, as clear as can be. And it was a very tall man. I couldn't really make out the figure. I couldn't really see 
anything that I could really describe. It was just a presence that sort of embodied a person. The figure that I've seen mm. has always been on the mezzanine. And it's been a tall man, you can yep. definitely say. Yep. Yeah. For a long time, I never said anything <laughs> because I'm pretty in tuned um, into seeing, I see dead people. Um, you probably didn't want to tell your new employers this. <laughs> well, no, exactly. Because... <laughs> And then there's Brenna Horner, former lead teaching artist for Everyman's Education Department, who I came to realize had experiences of her own, but like Corey, understandably kept it to herself. I would turn on the, the ghost light, hit the light switch, and just like as fast, I mean like pro and running in heels because I was just like, get out. It just felt um, like somebody was there. And I was so like, I don't want to be alone in this dark space by my, you know, with nobody else in the building. So you would always run run out at the end oh, of the day? Oh, I did. I would run, yeah. And I was like, let me run into someone who works here and just be completely mortified. But what are you? Is that you got? Yeah, no, no, no. I just feel like there's a ghost in there. No big deal. So I take it you never talked about this? You just kind of shrugged it off? One time Shema said something to me. He was like, people see stuff all the time here. There's like, you know, like a ghost in the theater and there's somebody who was like shot here. And I was like, what now? Some police officers came up to the building. I let them in the building because they was cops or whatever. It was just before one of the shows started. They had explained to me that a cop had died in our building years back before the building became every man. They was looking for uh, a person who was robbing something. I think robbing a bank or whatever the case would be. And they said a guy had died up on the second floor. They had like a little shootout or whatever. So I was like, well, that explains everything. And Corey told me about the time he mentioned what he saw on the mezzanine to operations manager Mike Watson one day. So we were just talking and I had mentioned to him, it's just like, I thought I saw someone up on the mezzanine. And he's like, oh, that again? <laughs> um, well, you know, there was a shooting. I was like, actually, I didn't know that. So either all of us are insane <laughs> or there is something to be said about what we see. I've heard the stories of like some gangster or somebody getting gunned down there at some point. Acting company member Tony Nam. That may feature into like one of the spirits that people see or feel in the space sometimes. Especially since there's all this sort of ghost lore uh, going on at, at every man about there being a ghost in the building. Former theater head of Baltimore School for the Arts, Donald Hicken. And I'm, I personally believe all that stuff. I, I love that stuff. I do know or had heard that there was a shootout. Acting company member Bruce Randolph Nelson. That some criminal took refuge in our theater and then the cops came in with their Tommy guns and fired on the place and killed this person. That person has been, at times, Lee Harvey Oswald, which is not possible because it's the wrong era and the wrong city. But okay. So that, that ghost is like roaming what would have been the balcony in his fedora, like looking for an FBI agent with a hole through his skull where the bullet went. Um, with a light shining through the hole. No, I don't know. But that's part of the lore. Okay, so Bruce wasn't much help, but here's founding artistic director Vincent Lanchisi. I think I first heard about it from Judy Russick, who, you know, is a critic who used to work for The Sun. And when she was researching the building, I had one of those, did you know that <laughs> there was a murder in your building <laughs> long time ago? And I said, uh, no. After we moved in and we heard that story of the FBI shootout thing. Director of production, Mandy Hall. I was like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. <laughs> well, what's that? And, you know, she told me the story. There's a bank robber from New, either New York or... Audio engineer, Andrew Galen. Maybe even California. It might have been California. This guy, Johnson, was a career criminal. Had been in and out of prison, including Alcatraz. And I don't know the, the details, but he got tangled up in what ended up being a murder. Los Angeles Times, September 26th, 1953. John Elgin Johnson, slain by FBI agents in Baltimore last night, was wanted for questioning in connection with a Huntington Park murder. 
A warrant was issued for Johnson's arrest by Huntington Park authorities following the August 2nd strangling of Richard Fagner, a 34-year-old machinist. September 27, 1953. Fagner apparently had befriended Johnson. Fagner was found strangled in his shower. The West Coast fugitive's record went back to 1935. The FBI disclosed he was sentenced to 15 years for bank robbery in 1941 and went to McNeil Island Federal Prison. He later was transferred to Alcatraz as a, quote, rough prisoner. Johnson got a conditional release from Alcatraz last March 20th. He crossed borders. He was in California. He was in the Southwest, down in Georgia. He, he, you know, he traveled around a lot. He was a career criminal. But somehow he got, you know, accused of, of this murder, which he never, by the way, I don't think he ever admitted that he had done it. I think he denied responsibility. But anyway, that's how he got on the FBI's most wanted list. This guy was wanted. FBI was trying to track him down. He was trying to go straight. At least that's the story. He was trying to, he had some money. <laughs> Where he got it, we don't know. Made his way to this area in search of trying to stay with a friend. He had some money and he wanted to set up a business. Somebody tipped off the FBI that he was in Baltimore. The Baltimore Evening Sun, September 28th, 1953. Miss Mary Brown, switchboard operator at a Reed's drugstore at Howard and Lexington Streets, said a man she was sure was Johnson came to her second floor location and asked for $15 in quarters. He came in just about six o'clock, Miss Brown said, and asked for the change so he could call Los Angeles. He said he had to get some reports in. She said she had told him the office safe was closed at 5 p.m., but she called the patent medicine counter and the cigar counter to see if they had changed. One had changed for 10 and the other for five, Miss Brown said. So I told them to give change to a tall, light-haired man who would be down in a few minutes. He ended up going into the movie theater, which is our space. At the time, it was still a movie theater. The town theater. And it wasn't the Empire then. By then, it was the town. It was 1953. So it had become the town right after the war. It used to be an old vaudeville house and then it was turned into a burlesque theater at one point and then a parking garage and then a movie theater. It was a movie theater. I think it was the town theater, right? Anyway, he was watching a movie, a thriller. I don't remember the name of it. The Baltimore Evening Sun, September 26th, 1953. The theater audience engrossed in the opening scenes of the Mickey Spillane thriller, I, the Jury. Introducing Biff Elliott as Mike Hammer. You recognize me, Big Mouth? I figured we'd meet again. Well, you got your wish. Not until I splash your teeth out all over the floor. A sock shot. <laughs> Raw. Real. Punch. The ruthless power of Mickey Spillane's hard-boiled flesh-and-blood character. Peggy Castle as beautiful Charlotte Manning. The girl who works in the dark but throws a new light on a man's emotion. The world, Mike, it could be ours. I never wanted the world. He had gone into the movie theater because it's a good place to kind of hide out. They had that phone booth. And made a phone call in the balcony phone booth. Well, in the mezzanine area. And I believe he was in contact with a news reporter this whole time while he was on the run. He had had some contact with a journalist in California. And called this reporter that he was talking to. So he gets on the phone with this guy, this reporter, who alerts the FBI, and the FBI basically says, keep him on the phone so they could trace the call. The number that he called in California was being tapped by the FBI. He kept him on the phone for like almost an hour talking about all kinds of stuff. The Evening Sun, September 26th, 1953. A Los Angeles newspaper man today related how he talked by long distance telephone for almost an hour with an ex-convict in a Baltimore movie house phone booth last night while the call was traced and the FBI closed in. The reporter, Sid Hughes, told of his tense experience in the Los Angeles Mirror today. Hughes wrote that he had known the ex-convict, John Elgin Johnson, for some time and had tried to aid in his rehabilitation. Hughes said Johnson first called him yesterday to tell him that he had found a man who was willing to put up $10,000 to go into a machine shop business and that he hoped he could get, quote, squared away in his trouble on the West Coast. Hughes, in his story, also related a portion of their long-distance telephone conversation as follows. Early in the conversation, I insisted on knowing whether Johnson was carrying a gun. He hesitated. 
There was a silence for several seconds. I want the truth, Johnny, I told him. I, I got it in my hand right now, he finally admitted. I'll always save a bullet for myself. Nobody will take me alive. I scolded him. You crazy fool. You might manage to square things, but if they pick you up with that heater, you won't be able to square that. Is there a river near you? I asked him. Maybe, he hedged. Take a walk and pitch that thing in the river. No, no, no. Throw it out the door of the phone booth. Get rid of it, I demanded. No, you remember what I told you? Nobody is going to take me. I ain't going back to that place, not for one hour. While on the phone with the reporter, the, the FBI knew he was there. They had tracked a suspect or, or, or a gangster down to that space. They finally uh, ultimately traced him to the second floor mezzanine lobby where there was a phone booth of the town theater. And had trapped him there. Said I, I got a funny feeling. Johnny kept saying. W what do you mean, Johnny? Well, you... When you live like I do, you get these kinds of feelings and you play them. The FBI apparently swarmed the building. They came in. Four of them. John Brady Murphy, Raymond J. Fox, and agents Myron C. Metcalf and Robert L. Van Wagener dashed to the theater at 311 West Fayette Street after they were alerted that Johnson was there placing a telephone call to Los Angeles. And there were two staircases that came up to that lobby from either side of the main lobby downstairs so two guys come up one side two guys come up the other side it was like an fbi raid with murphy in the lead they ran through the lobby and up the stairs closed to theater patrons at the time johnson sitting in the telephone booth apparently was prepared for them went in to do a raid and then there's johnson in the phone booth still on the phone with the reporter from Los Angeles. When one of the FBI agents appeared by the phone booth. The guy's coming up and he knows what, what this is about. So he pulls out his gun, he starts shooting. There was a whole altercation, a shootout. There was an FBI shootout. There was a shootout. A shootout with the with the FBI. It's like a shootout in the movie theater. There was a shootout in the freaking lobby of the theater. During a movie, there was a movie playing. He shot and killed an FBI agent there. He shot him. I mean, ultimately, the guy didn't die right away, but he killed one of the FBI guys. And he was killed. The FBI agent was killed. One of the agents, J. Brady Murphy, hit in the abdomen, died at Mercy Hospital at 3.50 a.m. despite an emergency operation. Another agent, Raymond J. Fox, fell during the battle with a bullet in the hip. His condition was described today at Mercy as good. And then they just blew him away. You know, they just fired on the place and killed this person. They shot him like seven times. And they ended up killing him. The FBI shot and killed him in that phone booth. He died right there in the, in the phone booth. Johnson toppled toward the floor, but his head crashing through the broken glass of the door held him partly erect. Before he stopped moving, he tried vainly once or twice to lift his head. The shooting itself had a weird half-world quality as it sounded to me over the long distance. The gunshots had a jingling coin tone, as though someone with a handful of quarters had poured them into the phone booth in six blasts. It was like slugs shattering a coin box. I'll never forget that sound, followed by a terrible kind of silence. He was wearing a white shirt, necktie, and business suit. Police said Johnson, when his body was pulled out of the battered phone booth, groaned once and then apparently died. The first Baltimore officers at the scene described Johnson as a big man, over six feet tall. Quote, he filled the stretcher, they said. The Evening Sun, September 26th, 1953. In all my research of the FBI shootout in our building back in 1953, there was something I came across that I had never seen before. On the second page of the Evening Sun was a diagram of the town theater, marking the spot of the mezzanine telephone booth where John Elgin Johnson's restless soul ultimately left his body. I had to show this to my company. Morning. Morning. I love that Rembrandt moody lighting you got going. <laughs> Very gorgeous. Right, nice. I'm, hey, uh, how you corner. doing? <laughs> I'm all right. I've been up. I was up in the Berkshires at doing, my dude? cabin. For all right. All right. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. It feels like it's been 20 years since last we talked. Um, this Probably whole year not. has been insane. I mean, it's good. I mean, I've been, honestly, I've been back and forth with the cabin a lot like, and I know it's seeing family, mostly like I'm sorry to be so hard to get. No, I'm not at all. Connecting. How are you? I get it. I'm good. I found the actual evening sun 
article, the big like three page cover story. And of course it made national news. Right. And um, I wanted to share some of this with you and just kind of, you know, get some <clears throat> of your reactions if you don't mind. Not at all. Let me, let me share the screen with you. All right. Do you see it? Yeah, it's coming up. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. So this is the day after it, the, the shooting happened the 25th. Uh, this is the 26th. What year is this? This is 53. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he was on long distance in the phone booth upstairs in the mezzanine for about an hour with this guy. You said mezzanine and I went, ooh, because I've seen the guy on the mezzanine. Yeah. So he hangs out in the doorway, sort of as you're going up the stairwell. Um, yeah. I wanted to show you this diagram of the theater that was in the paper where the shooting took place. So this is, this is uh, Fayette Street down here. And this is our entrance. And then you go up to the mezzanine. And this is where the phone booth was. Whoa. That's really interesting. Wow, that's amazing that that the mezzanine, your the the everyman mezzanine actually encompasses the location where the phone booth was. Oh, that's that's cool. That's cool to see. I've never I haven't seen that before. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Kind of oh. makes it all make sense, you know, with uh where people have seen them. So you ready? Yeah. This, this is a a layout of the town theater and where the shooting took place up in the mezzanine. Here we go. Okay. This is the Fayette Street and this is our entrance. And you go up the mezzanine <gasps> and that's where he was killed. That's where everybody sees him. That's literally where everybody sees him right there, Danny. Yeah. And that's where the phone booth was. Mm. Yeah. That's so crazy. Oh, the stair. Okay. Sorry. I'm also like the blueprint is a little different. The stairs do something different now. Um, yeah. But uh, so this was, this was all its own floor, the mezzanine. Uh -huh. It, was, yes, it wasn't see. an open plan like ours. You go up mm -hmm. the stairs and you're in a separate floor and there's a fucking phone booth smack dab right in the middle. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's, that's so where he is, right? That's where he hangs out. That's literally where everybody reports seeing that guy. And he paces. Whoever that guy is, he paces. I see somebody in the theater more often. I feel a presence up there sometimes. Yeah, me too. Me but too. I, I don't see a lot up there. I see a shadow sometimes. But that's where they, exactly where they report it. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. And the thought of him struggling in the booth, shot to death, but still trying to get up, is... Uh, unsettling yeah <laughs> mm. and i wanted to show you just a picture of his mug shot and then him uh, here we go so that's that's him <gasps> okay and that's his mug shot from alcatraz but look at that i showed that to Corey, and oh he's my God. You know, did he freak out <laughs> because that's the silhouette isn't it i mean that's the yeah that's the silhouette that i that's the guy. See, um, that actually looks very similar to the figure. Actually, like in all honesty, yeah, yeah. But it's it's him. It's yeah. got to be. Yeah. Mm. What a great find. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. Hold on a second. Um. Anyway, so you my, got you got a jet? Yeah, my grandson is here, and I got to take him back over to his house. But we're. Cool. We're looking at a bank robber here that got killed in the town theater in a shootout. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? You want to see a picture of him? Yeah. Come thing. around here and take a look. Let me show you. This so is this... the the theater lobby, oh, and, and this is the guy here. That's the criminal who was shot and killed, and he killed one of the FBI guys guy right here. in the shootout. This is a criminal, uh -huh. yeah. and then the FBI guy had we... children. He had three kids. Nineteen yeah. nineteen. Well, it happened in 1953. 53, yeah. And they think his ghost is still haunting the theater. Mm. I'd like to say one thing. Donald Hicken's grandson, Philip. Who you gonna call? <laughs> <laughs>
This episode is in honor of Special Agent John Brady Murphy. Your support makes every episode possible. Visit everymantheater.org to check out our incredible 30th anniversary season and to make a donation today. Or text GHOST, G-H-O-S-T, to 44321. Every donation, no matter the size, makes a difference.